Spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. No need to turn up the heat. We like it cold. It's episode 405 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham, and in from the cold, the biggest surprise hit on Netflix, certainly this year, if not in recent memory anyway, and, and well, no surprise to me because the show is amazing right from the start as far as I'm concerned. And hey, it's a top 10 Netflix hit still, so let's revisit it, shall we? Lola May Lochran is here to talk about playing Maddie on the series. She's got really great insight into the relationship with Becca and things like, like that, so I'll talk to her about that here coming up. Also... Got some big reviews this week. Catwoman Hunted, the new DC animated reviews out. I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about the premiere of Bel Air, the reboot series on Peacock. Is it worth your time? I'll let you know about that. Some interesting nerd news coming up as well. And our sponsor, Storyblocks, is back. Oh, those creative projects that you could make if you only had Storyblocks. And I'll tell you how you can get that here in just a few, but hey, it's time to start things off and get in from the cold once again. Alola May Lochran is here to talk to me about the Netflix series next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Adi Shankar, and I'm on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. So clearly you've caught on that In From the Cold is an amazing spy series that you should be watching on Netflix. It's been spending a lot of time in the top 10. So many great things about this spy story, and I gotta tell you, one of the characters that was a big surprise to me, was Maddie. So I had to get Lola May Lochran on to talk about all things Maddie and about him from the cold. Lola, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. So Lola, correct me if I'm wrong now, but this is your first major series role, correct? Yes, this is my first major series role. So what was that like? I mean, you've, you've done guest starring stuff and a lot of really cool things. But what was it like to really be able to expand on a character more and be more of a series regular? It was honestly, it was so great. It was really nice to have a character and take her through like a whole series rather than just like, oh, like one episode here, one episode there, like small, small arcs. Um, it was nice to see a character through on a journey and also have a character that interacts with like a big overarching storyline. It was really nice. And it was fun to be there for I was there until maybe like two, three weeks from the end. So it was nice to spend like a full time on a project and like hang out with everyone and not just like disappear, like be in for a couple of weeks and then just disappear, (laughs) never be seen again. No doubt about that. So this is a really interesting show. I thought I loved it really from the start when I started watching it. So when you started first getting the script and you were starting to get into the role of Maggie, what was your first impression of the show and of her? Well, I originally auditioned for Becca. So I originally went up for the daughter. Oh, wow. And that would have been yeah, cool. When I went up, went up for it, there was a couple of scenes to a scene from episode one, which I think possibly was the scene with Maddie in the, in the ice rink. And then another one with Jenny. And they gave you episodes one and two. So you did find out the twist. I knew the twist from like the early twists from the auditioning process. And then about two weeks later, I got a phone call from agent and they were like, hi, um, basically they might want to see you for Maddie. They're thinking of you for the best friend. And I was like, okay, well, just let me know what they want from me. Thinking that I was gonna have to like go back in audition, do another recall, stuff like that. And then probably two weeks after that, my agent called me and I remember because she woke me up and I was like, hello, like trying to pretend that I was already awake because I worked like a closing shift at a shop the night before. And she was like, oh, so um, you're spending the summer in Spain. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, they just want to cast you as Maddie. And I was like, OK, cool. Thank you. So yeah, obviously that was back in 2020. So that was when it was originally going to shoot, which was going to be March to July. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was how I got into it. So it was it was weird because she was also the first character where I hadn't seen like a character breakdown, obviously, because I'd never auditioned for the role. I'd never seen a character breakdown. I didn't know kind of any preconceptions of the character. So I didn't know what they had said to like casting of like what they were looking for and stuff like that. So I kind of was like, okay, let me read through 
the episode one and two that I have, I think between when they were like, oh, they're thinking of you for the role and getting it. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, let me read through one and two and see the bits that she has and try and get a feel for the character. So yeah, a lot of my prep work was like when we started film, like the rehearsals and when we got out there. And I liked the character and I just knew that I didn't want her to be a stereotype. Mm -hmm. I was like, I want, I don't want her to just be the best friend character. Like I want her to kind of stand on her own. So I liked, I did like Maddie and it's someone who's on the outside, but kind of can see hints of like what might be going on or just knowing that something's not quite right. Like something's happening but also wants to focus on themselves. And they're like, well, I have a competition. I have to do all the stuff is going on, but still there's this competition. Right. And I thought right. it was quite nice that everyone else has all these complicated things. And she's kind of like, yeah, yeah, but I need to skate though. So yeah, I've got things to kind of prepare for kind of important moment for me. So speaking of that though, what's it like when you see that and you go, oh, by the way, I hope you can skate because uh, that's going to be part of it. So did, did you have any experience doing that? Or did you like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to have to learn this on the fly? Well, when I auditioned for Becca, initially at my age, I was like, she's an ice skater. You don't have to skate. Like they've said, you don't have to <laughs> okay. be a figure skater. You don't have to like really know how to skate. They're going to deal with that. And I was like, okay. And I hadn't gone ice skating since I was 16. So this was like a good couple of years ago I was like I haven't been ice skating since then just because there's not many ice rinks in London for some reason not near me and so then they asked in the room they were like like on tape they were like well what's your what's your ice skating experience and I was like yeah I can I can skate like recreationally I don't fall over really and then when I got it they were like yeah don't worry they were still like don't worry because there's going to be doubles we're going to we're going to teach you how to skate and I was like okay flew out there got fitted for my skates flew back flew out there again with our skates and uh, they were like yeah your ice skating lessons are starting we were like cool and I had never done this much exercise in my life like the sessions were it was two hours every day for a month I'm pretty sure and then it was still just whenever we were free we did two hour sessions pretty much and we had personal training as well on top of this and I thought I was going to die. Like the first two weeks of skating <laughs> lessons, my body was screaming at me. And we had like PAs. We had these PAs that we mm -hmm. had to call to be like, hi, can you go to the pharmacy and get us this? And can of you go course, to the supermarket? Yeah. Cause, yeah, because they didn't really want us like leaving. And all of us, like me and Lydia, who plays Becca, were like, please, Sophia, please. We need ice packs. We need heat packs. We need <laughs> ibuprofen. I need ibuprofen gel. Just whatever there is that will help this. I think I actually brought the ice pack home. Like she bought me like a really good gel ice pack. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to take this <laughs> with me. And I think I brought like all the gel home, like Arnica. I had like these compression socks at one point, like all this, wow. like icy hot. We were like, please, we just I'd need been anything filling the help. bathtub with just bags of ice and just laying in that. Essentially. I think, I think Lydia may have ordered Epsom salts. It reached a point where wow. we, where we knew. Wow. what marguerite was doing and we felt really bad about complaining but we were like i'm in agony you'll be <laughs> watching the agony. winter olympics a completely different way now that's that's oh, that's funny pretty much <laughs> so you talked about shooting in madrid what was it actually like shooting there and what was your favorite part about being there during that time i think my favorite part of being there and i think having to film the way we did where we all had to isolate together and we all had to just, we essentially lived in these two hotels for the whole of filming. And it really brought us closer together and allowed us to bond way stronger than we would have, I imagine, if it had just been a lot of us flying in and out. So I spent a lot of time, particularly towards the end, with Charles, who plays Chris, and Jeremy, who plays Suyin. And I wouldn't have seen either of them because I don't have scenes with them. Mm -hmm. I definitely don't have any scenes with Jeremy because he's all the flashbacks. And so it was nice to like hang out with people where you're like, I probably would have never seen you because when would our paths have crossed? Like our mm -hmm. paths wouldn't have crossed that much. And we used to spend like the weekends like playing the, the Switch or like playing the PS4. And so it was really nice. And I think, yeah, it was a lot less isolating because I was a bit worried because it's kind of like, okay, I'm spending five, six months in a foreign country. I essentially can't leave the house because mm -hmm. that was kind of what we were told. We were like, you can't go cinema, can't go here, can't go there we could barely go to the supermarket 
And so I was a bit like, oh, I hope I make friends. It's kind of like starting boarding school or something. You're like, oh, oh I hope yeah. I make friends. I hope I have a good time. Yeah, it was really nice. Obviously, Madrid's a lovely city anyway. It's a beautiful city as it is. It was nice to kind of, we could go on walks and experience the city not as tourists because we couldn't really do touristy things. Mm-hmm. So, but we really was like, we were just living there in a giant house share. It was mad, but really nice. It was one of my best filming experiences. It sounds sure. like that was definitely a lot of fun though. So that that's really, really cool. When you're watching this show, if any anybody that's had a chance to, to dive into it, there just seems to be such a, a, a unique bond between Maddie and Becca. How would you kind of describe their bond? And are we talking like more than just best friends at this point, you think? Well, I think it's kind of open up to interpretation, definitely. How I spoke about it with Adam when just before filming, when we each had sit downs with him. So I have been friends with my best friend for, I think, almost 15 years now. Wow. We're coming up. Yeah, it's very long time since I was about 10. So about almost 15 years. And obviously Becca and Maddie, kind of the backstory we came up with was that they had been friends since they were very young. So like kindergarten, maybe like first, second grade. And that's when they started skating together and things like that. And so I went into it and was like, well, my relationship with my best friend is that we're like sisters now. So it's kind of, to me, I was like, that's a a sister relationship. I feel it's obviously, it may get written differently, it may get interpreted differently, Mm -hmm. but I was kind of like, that's a sister relationship, particularly as it goes along and kind of like how you fall out with a sibling and that kind of sometimes when there's tension between the two of you and it's that kind of thing of like, oh, there's there's food in the fridge. Like, we're still good, yeah? (laughs) And that's kind of how I, I viewed their relationship particularly on like Maddie's side, that kind of thing of I am concerned for you and about you, but I don't always go about it the right way. But that's teenagers as well. That's oh, no doubt. Yeah. You made it true to life. So that's that's always a good thing. <laughs> and one of the th- other things I really like, not just about about Becca, but about Maddie as well. I don't want to say that they're outcasts, but they definitely march to the beat of their own drum, which is really, really, how cool was that for you to like, well, so you could say they're outcasts, but they're not. They're like, you know, you guys go be stupid. We're going to go do our thing and have fun. (laughs) Yeah, that was definitely something that I wanted to put in for Maddie because on the page, you could maybe read it as like, she's a super popular girl who like is in with the in crowd, but then just has this best friend that she's had for years who is like a bit weird. And I went to Adam and I was like, no, I kind of want it where Maddie doesn't like these other girls. Like she isn't really friends with them. She's just good at skating. And so they're like, oh, like she's our friend because she's really good. And really she's like, no, I actually I actually don't like any of you. Um, <laughs> like she's my best friend. I'm just here. <laughs> I just ended up in this situation. I don't really like any of you. But she's one of those girls where I was like, if she's popular, it's kind of against her will. She's just kind of going along with the flow, but she's like, no, here's my real friend. And this is who I want to actually spend my time with. It just says it all in episode one. And I really, really love that. If anybody, when you see it, there's a scene at the hotel that's perfectly describes that whole situation <laughs> she's just talking about, which I really, really loved. Now let's get into the whole situation with the parents, because that yeah. that's where it gets a little bit weird and a little <laughs> bit awkward. So, I mean, Again, we don't want to spoil anything, obviously, but how do you think that Maddie's going to react if she really finds out what's going on with Jenny? Personally, from like bits that I put in, whether I don't think some of them made the show, some of my improv moments, I think that, and from what I discussed with Adam, I think Maddie would roll with it. I think she'd be like, okay, a lot of things now make sense. Let's go with it. (laughs) Let's just keep it moving. Because I, I remember I said to Adam, I was like, she would have known if they've been, if her and Becca have been friends since they were kids, she's then known Jenny since she was a kid. Exactly. And I always, I put in a lot of bits where I was like, oh, your mom's just like overprotective. I quite like her. I think she's cool. Like, I don't know what you're complaining about. <laughs> like, my mom is always on my case. So I think you should be grateful. So I think she would roll with it. I think it'd be one of those ones where she'd be like, wow, cool. A bit like the kid in the kid on the lawn in the Incredibles. He's like, wow, that's amazing. Oh yes. What a great example. I I genuinely think she'd be like that. It got me thinking though, Lola, and I wanted to ask you this. 
How would you react if you found out today that your mom was a spy? Again, I think I would. I think I would roll with it personally. I think I'd be like, <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. What What can you do? I'd probably ask inappropriate questions like, so, how many people? Have you killed? Oh, I'd have a thousand questions, and that would be the first one. <laughs> I need to know. I'd be like, "Where have you been? What have you done? What what kind of spy are we talking here?" And once the cat's out of the bag, she might as well tell you, right? It's not like yeah, the secrets exactly. need to be kept at this point. I'd be like, "Are you training me? What are we doing? How did you get into it? Is it a family legacy? How does it work?" So here's another thing I was thinking about because would it surprise you at some point? And again, I don't want to talk any spoilers or anything like that. But would it surprise you at some point if we find out that maybe Maddie's got some secret skills? Not necessarily that she's a spy, but maybe she's got some skills that uh, she's been hiding from everybody a little bit. Well, this is what I always made um, Adam and Chris Barber laugh because I was like, yeah, you know, I can throw knives. Yeah. And they were like, what? I was like, yeah, I can throw knives. I, I learned how to throw knives in middle school. I, I know how to shoot bow and arrow. I did archery. And they'd just be like, wait, what? And I was like, yeah, these are the things that I know how to do. I'm just letting you know. Like, if we go again, I think I did. I said to Chris at one point, I was like, if we go again, I want either to throw knives or fire a gun. I want one of the two. I'm, I'm telling you it's right now, you. if I get a vote, <laughs> I'm voting throw knives because that would be terrifying for me. Like, exactly. obviously guns I... are scary, right? But you see somebody <laughs> pull out a knife and chuck it and it like sticks in the wall next to your head or something. I'd be gone. I'd be exactly. out of there. <laughs> that is a girl. How, where, where does someone learn how to do I have to ask because uh, you said you've been doing it since middle school. I have to know where does someone learn their knife throwing skills? It was a I went to so I went to a Steiner school between the ages of 11 to I think I was 14. So a couple of years. And they do a lot of like, oh, you know, wilderness, survival, stuff like that. And we went on a camping trip and we got given knives to do like whittling. And we were kind of like, okay, um, can we throw them? And they were like, yeah, okay, sure. We'll show you how to throw the knives. And like, we spent a whole <laughs> afternoon throwing knives and it was really fun. And then archery was the same school. They were like, yeah, so for gym, you're going to do archery. I think we also learned circus skills. So I knew how wow. to walk on a tightrope and ride a unicycle as well can we do all of those things together or is that just not <laughs> safe because that would be that's a next that's another level of I, I could just see you know they're trying to escape from somewhere and here's here's maddie on a on a unicycle going from one building to another just chucking <laughs> knives at people i just think if that if you could pull that off more power to I you mean, that I would do be incredible that joke i was like i can't drive but i can throw knives so <laughs> <laughs> you, you and I went to me. very different schools is all I'm saying that's uh, why couldn't I go to that school because that would have been a lot of fun wow that's crazy so obviously I was I was gonna ask about hopes for season two but I guess that's one of them but do you yes. have any more <laughs> hopes for for Maddie in season two or just the show in general for the show in general I think my one hope is one I hope we go again two talking to Adam because they kind of want to put each series in a different in a different place in a different city and i was rooting for berlin because i speak german oh yes and my whole thing about living in spain was that everyone thought i spoke spanish like particularly because of my name and i do not speak spanish do not speak that much spanish i would panic and be like oh, no, i don't know you're not say mm. but german i speak i was like i could handle myself and no one would expect me to speak german so can we please go to berlin and I think they finally cracked. I was like, yeah, Berlin's one of the top places if we go again. I was like, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that would be so, so cool. I could so see this show <laughs> in Berlin for sure. That would be that would be wunderbar as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so that's a, my, my, my wife speaks German. So I picked up a little bit of it myself. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask you this before I let you go, because, you know, you think of other spy genres. You think of like Jason Bourne. You think of John Wick. You think of uh, Black Widow for lack of yeah. a better way. So, I, so I'm, I'm thinking about Anya slash Jenny, and I'm thinking, okay, would she team up with Black Widow, or would this be a situation where she's kind of trying to take her down? So where do you think that would stand? If we, if we got that team up somehow, some way, wh where do you think that would stand, do you think? I think it depends. If we're, going, if we're going MCU Black Widow, I think it would be a versus situation. I think it would be, it would be Jenny versus Black Widow. If we're talking about Black Widow in the comics, it might be a team up. 
It depends. It depends on what arc and what universe you're discussing. Look at you with the comics flex. I love that. Oh, that is so great. I love it. And I don't disagree with you at all, which is which is awesome. <laughs> that is so, so cool. And, and what could she take her, though? That's the question. Oh, I th yeah. I think she could. I've seen Margaret in action. We saw some of their stunt sequences. I think she could take her. <laughs> oh, the gauntlet is thrown down, and that is why we definitely need a season two now. Event from the Cold. You see season one, though, on Netflix. Make sure you're streaming that thing. Tell everybody about it, too, because this show is, is so unique. It's so cool, and it's something you're definitely going to want to add to your Netflix list. It's Lola May Lochran. Thank you so much for joining me. No problem. So who would have known before this conversation started that I'd be talking to a knife-throwing, circus-performing ice skater? Never would have pegged that from a Lola May, but apparently very multi-talented, and it really, really shows an in from the cold from Netflix. Seriously, watch this show if you haven't already. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Thank you to Lola May Locker for joining me this week to talk about Netflix's in from the cold. Up next, I have a lot to say about the finale of The Book of Boba Fett, and we'll do it with spoilers next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hello, this is Emmett Esmer from Blindspot on NBC and you are listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. The battle for Mos Espa is on and the Book of Boba Fett finale has happened on Disney Plus and I don't think I can even talk about this intelligently without using spoilers. So just if you if that upsets you, then you're just going to have to fast forward about seven or eight minutes because I, I just don't think I can do this review justice without doing spoilers, okay? Plus, you've probably already seen it anyway. So here's the deal. This is going to be a little all over the place because, you know, so was the season, so why not? So, obviously, this was predictable, very predictable in many, many ways, this finale was. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that was a bad thing. Just because you saw certain things coming doesn't necessarily mean that it was the wrong choice. Like, you know, everybody betraying Boba Fett and going back on the deal. Was that surprising? No, not at all. Grogu showing up to help the Mandalorian with the armor on. Is, was that surprising? No, not at all. Those, there's just a couple of examples of things that you sort of expected to happen. And they did. Now, everybody shows up, basically, in this finale. Every, everybody that you saw throughout the season, literally everyone that mattered, showed up in this finale and the battle was, I got, I got to be honest, the battle was pretty epic. It was a very, very cool battle with a lot of great stuff. They finally made Boba Fett a strong character. And that was the one thing that they did very, very correctly in this finale. Is they finally stopped letting him get punked out all the time. And they finally made him a strong character. You know, obviously there were some elements of the battle that were overwhelming at times. And, you know, it made sense to, you know... The, the whole group that was outnumbered have them fall back, right? Well, not necessarily all the time, but when the Mandalorian, when Mando and Boba Fett come out of the, of the, of the club and the burned out club that was bombed and they just start taking out Pike syndicate guys, that was impressive. That was, that was a big move. And I thought that that was really, really cool way to sort of start things off. And then I'm not going to go, you know, battle for, you know, battle shot for battle shot with you. But there were some interesting things that happened there. And Black Chrysanthemum, by the way, just a warrior throughout this whole freaking episode. And if we don't see that character again, that is going to be a really, really be a shame because they really prop that character up in this finale as well. I really hope that we see him again. Now, here's the problem, though. There's a part in the battle where... It looks like the tide's turning, right? And Boba Fett and Mando and company, they're starting to get the upper hand. And they're just slaughtering pikes in to get people after the people of Freetown show up and all that stuff. And then out come these giant droids with gun with big guns and they've got shields. It's almost like um it's almost like the, the droids that they used on in the prequels and the Star Wars prequels, but like on steroids. These things were huge. My first thought was you guys had these the whole time. The Pike Syndicate did. And you waited until you were being slaughtered to bring out these guns. You could have brought these out first and let them do their damage. And then you could have taken your troop numbers. Or, or I don't know if you want to necessarily call them troops. Whatever. And then you could have you know, cleaned up 
after that because obviously you knew these guns were your big guns and could have taken everything out. But they didn't do that. And that again, you want to talk about failed battle strategy. That was definitely one. Was that a failed writing strategy? Not necessarily. And and I understand that 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 to me that just seems like a stupid choice by the Pike Syndicate's part. But maybe that was a choice that was made by the writers to show maybe the Park Pike, Pike Syndicate isn't really that smart. And that and that's you know certainly a possibility. So that that was one that left me scratching my head. Another one was when Cad Bane. If you want, we'll, let's skip to the end here for a second, and then we'll go back. So Cad Bane shows up towards the end of the battle. By the way, again, not you're you're keeping your big guns on the sidelines, and although he was said he was just tired to be a negotiator, so maybe he wasn't hired to fight in the battle. I don't know, but so you put him back into things, and you know he has the final showdown with Boba Fett, and you know how that works out. So fans are upset. That Cad Bane dies. And I say dies in a very air quote sense because you saw what happened in the in the end credit scene with with the with the Marshall. So I'm just gonna put that out there. So we, we have to assume that he's dead though. And then you go on social media and you get all these fans that are upset that Cad Bane is dead. And I get it. This is a character you've been waiting for, and they killed him off. But you were just you were just bitching about how he looked on the show and how they did it wrong. And now you're upset that they killed him off. I mean, well, at least you don't have to look at the look you didn't like anymore. Right. You can't be upset about that. Now. I don't think again, I don't know that we've necessarily seen the last of this character because it's certainly a character that could pop up in other shows that happened prior to this book of Boba Fett show. Right. So let's just keep that in mind. Okay. So this is not necessarily goodbye forever. For Cad Bane. I just thought that that was funny. That that sort of happened. I did really like though. As we backtrack a little bit. That Boba Fett riding the Rancor. That that paid off. I, was, I wasn't I was sure that they were going to end up paying that off. And it really really did. So when the Pike Syndicate brought out their droids. Boba Fett brought out his big gun. And that was the Rancor. Here's the thing that upset me though. And I love that the Rancor was just tearing through everything. And did did struggle a little bit, but tore through everything. So then there's this, a point where Boba Fett gets knocked off the Rancor. And the the people of Freetown are like, their Rancor is on the loose. And they start shooting the freaking Rancor. And I'm like, what are you doing? Is this not the, the, the creature that saved your ass 10 seconds ago? Didn't come after you at all? Maybe because Boba Fett was riding it, but still. And I understand fear the Rancor and all that stuff. But this this creature was just helping you, showed no aggression towards you whatsoever, wasn't showing aggression towards you at the time, and your answer is, I'm scared to death, I'm going to start shooting the Rancor, when you've already got bigger problems about the Pike Syndicate, which is still there, by the way, the battle's not over, right? Now, it looks good, but the battle's not over, and you decide to say, you know what, screw the rest of the Pike Syndicate, let's shoot the Rancor and make it angry. And let's make that a problem for us as well. How stupid was that? That is the one that is the one part of this episode that really made me just jump out of my chair and go, what in the hell are you doing right now? Obviously, works out in the end for everybody. But at the same time, I just didn't understand that at all. But the other thing was when when Grogu comes out and Grogu plays a huge role in this episode showing off. His skills. And of course, Din Djarin has no idea the skills that he's developed. I mean, he went to visit him in that one episode, but didn't really get a good sense of how skillful Grogu was. So he's the one that kind of, when the Rancor decides that the Rancor has had enough and is going to go after Mando, after Mando kind of goes on the offensive to try and tame the Rancor, which at that point he had no choice. I'm not blaming Mando at all. Mando had no choice because the Rancor was getting aggressive after being shot at for no particular reason. So when Grogu steps in to save Mando and sort of calms the Rancor, I thought he was going to do the the Jedi wave thing and do it that way. And maybe that's what he was doing. But so Grogu basically calms the Rancor, puts it to sleep in a certain sense. And I thought to myself right after that, I was like, so Luke didn't have to kill the Rancor after all. Right? In Return of the Jedi. You know, again, 
you don't know maybe you don't know that going in right but at the same time I'm going so Grogu doesn't attack the Rancor at all uses the force to calm the Rancor whereas when Luke was fighting the Rancor Luke ends up crushing it under the door because he thought he had no choice I just thought it was interesting that that Grogu made that choice and maybe the the child is not going to try to choose the most aggressive path for a reason but I just thought that that was very very interesting as well but this thing certainly sets up this finale certainly sets up a lot of stuff for the future certainly sets up Mando season three with him going off with Grogu and we don't see a lightsaber so I think we know what he chose or did he or should he have even had to make that choice at all was the thing that that I didn't really understand and it, it like Luke never made that same mistake. Like Luke never bailed on Yoda to go save his friends. Come on, Luke. Come on. You know better than that. But anyway, I actually I didn't hate the finale. Didn't hate the season. I just wish that they could have structured it a little bit better. If they'd have called it something else to other than the book of Boba Fett, I think that we would have viewed it differently. If because at times it was everybody but Boba Fett sort of thing, right? And and I think that the, the title was deceiving. I don't think we really got the gangster organized crime thing that we were hoping for. I say we as fans. I can only really speak for myself. But I really was, I don't think that I, I fully got what I expected from this show. But there were a lot of good things about this show as well. I thought Fennec Shand was really, really great. I think bringing in Black Chrysanthemum was great. What they did to set up the third season of Mando was really, really cool. The Pike Syndicate ended up being a, a surprisingly strong villain. I did like the backstory of the Tuscans that they did early on. So there were a lot of good things. I understand that maybe the Book of Boba Fett wasn't this huge thing that you were hoping it would be, but I think Boba, the character of Boba Fett has been propped up by a lot of Star Wars fans, myself included at times, more than he probably should have been. We paint Boba Fett as this uncontrollable badass character when really if you look back didn't have a ton of major roles in the Star Wars movies and I I mean as far as time goes I mean obviously what happened with Han Solo and everything like that yes there were plenty of moments where Boba Fett was the dude when it came to the bounty hunters but at the same time it's not like he played a major, major role and was this huge adversary in the Star Wars universe. So I think this character got propped up a little bit more in the past. And and them heroing him up maybe was a problem for some people. But they, they set the stage and showed you why they did that. They made it make sense. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it was the wrong thing to do. So I think it'll be very interesting to see how time treats the book of Boba Fett and see how we look back on it. A little bit later on in the light of day. But I got to tell you, overall, I enjoyed the season. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. But I still enjoyed the ride for what it was. This week, the Down and Nerdy Podcast is brought to you by Storyblocks. And I know you're probably thinking, you know, why am I not getting more likes? Why am I not getting more clicks? Why am I not getting more action on my Kickstarter? Well, one of the reasons is maybe you don't have enough video. Because modern video is something that just people want. They want those really professional looking videos, but you're saying, I don't have the time for that. I don't have the money for that. Where would I even go to find something like that? You go to Storyblocks. That's why, because they've got royalty-free, demand-driven library, 4K HD footage stuff that you can use. Plus, if, if you're looking for very diverse and inclusive content as well, they've absolutely got you covered there. And as far as budget goes, yeah, they've got s- subscriptions for every budget, so you don't have to worry about that at all. And, by the way, unlimited downloads. So, if you're doing that and you're really, really looking for something that you want to really ramp up, so you're thinking, I need a whole bunch of stuff, not going to be a problem at all. That's why you go to storyblocks.com slash D-N-P-O-D. That's storyblocks.com slash D-N-P-O-D to see exactly what they have available for you. doesn't matter if you're a freelancer or if you're an influencer or if you're a marketing pro. Storyblocks is something you need. They've also got templates for After Effects or Premiere Pro if you've already got that. I'm talking music, images, sound, and more. Storyblocks.com slash D-N-P-O-D to stop making excuses and start making videos 
with story blocks. That's going to do it for my spoiler-filled review of the Book of Boba Fett finale. Up next, time to head to the DC Universe and talk about the new animated feature, Catwoman Hunted. We'll do that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Julie Nathanson from Far Cry 5, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. More new and different things coming from the DC Animated Universe, and this one definitely right up there. Catwoman Hunted has been released by Warner Brothers Home Entertainment, and I wanted to give a spoiler-ish review of this thing since it's been out since Tuesday, so I think we could talk a little bit of spoilers, so nothing major. I'm not going to spoil anything big. So just be aware of that, and be aware that Warner Brothers Home Entertainment did provide me with a free copy of this Blu-ray for review, all views are my own. Now, I want to start off by just saying one thing right off the bat. That Liz Gillies, as the voice of Catwoman Selena Kyle, is the star of the freaking show. Let me tell you that right now. She did such an incredible job as Catwoman and Selena Kyle in this movie. I can't even tell you how much I enjoyed her, port- her portrayal. As a matter of fact, anytime she wants to come back and voice this role... I'm down. I'm ready. I think that just for that reason alone, I would want a sequel to this just to have her back as Catwoman. I just think she did a great job. She brought such fun to the role. She brought such a great snarkiness to it. The cockiness was right there. The sultriness was there when it had to be. I thought it was a great job. And by the way, too, stellar animation for this. I was really, really digging the animation style for this thing and and the music just set the mood right from the get go. It had this funky like 70s type vibe to it, which I was really really loving. Uh, they, they, the the only thing uh, the only criticism I'd have is they didn't do it enough. I didn't get enough of that throughout the rest of the movie. You get that at the beginning and I don't get enough of it throughout the rest. So that that's one of my only gripes about this thing. Could have done better. With the music, and when I when I praise Liz Gillies, I don't want to I don't want to do that to say that the rest of the cast wasn't good because they absolutely were good. Stephanie Patrice did such a good job as Batwoman as well, and that that dynamic between Catwoman and Batwoman is not one that we see a ton. That was one of the things that I thought was kind of refreshing about this was seeing that back and forth between Kate Kane and Selena Kyle. And, of course, Batwoman and, and Catwoman. So this Bat and Cat relationship was a little different. I like that there are little winks and nods to the whole relationship with Batman, too. I, I liked that they threw that in there, but it wasn't a huge part of things. You've probably seen it in the first look photos. Uh, uh, the classic Catwoman costume actually makes an appearance in this thing, which I really, really loved, too. A, a nice little wink and a nod to fans there. It, it doesn't, it's not a major part of the movie, but it's it's there, and... And I really, really enjoyed it. Now, here's the biggest spoiler that I can give you. And that is that Leviathan is basically the big threat of this. You'd think that law enforcement's kind of a threat to this because, you know, you know, Catwoman is a thief after all. I don't get that here. I mean, it's kind of part of the story and, and one of the reasons that she gets drawn in. But I never really see them as a threat. So I don't know that I'd say she's dodging that. I think that's a little bit of a misconception. And Leviathan is really the biggest part of this whole thing. And Black Mask, kind of in a weird way, is a catalyst to this whole thing. So I think that that's really, really cool. Jonathan Banks actually did a pretty darn good job as Roman Sionis as well in this movie. So you get a very interesting list of villains here. You've got Black Mask, you've got Tobias Whale, one that you don't really expect by the way, is, and again, maybe this is a little bit of a spoiler, is Barbara Minerva. I That was one that, that you don't necessarily think of when you think of Leviathan, I guess, but what a different version of Barbara Minerva than we're used to. Not just smart, but really cunning and tough. I mean, she's tough in other instances too, but tough in a different way and more commanding than you'd usually see Barbara Minerva and a certain well you know that name so you know who she is and maybe you get a little bit of that in this movie and maybe you don't and I will just leave it at that but just seeing the this particular version of Leviathan I thought was kind of interesting and how Leviathan is approached as a threat 
I thought was really, really neat too. Plus, you get to you get to find out who's really pulling the strings of Leviathan, too. By the way, so there, there's a little bit of that going on as well, and we get to see some of the inner workings of Leviathan. But this movie, the real strength of it was the was the byplay between Batwoman and Catwoman, and just the way that Catwoman carries herself throughout the movie. I think is really, really the most fun. For me, so I got to say bravo to Greg Wiseman who wrote the script on this and and just gave us the Catwoman that we deserved in this thing. And then the the action scenes were a lot of fun. Was it perfect? No, I do think that you know we get a little bit off the rails towards the end a little bit with the with the threats that they face. I don't know that you needed to go that far. I, it didn't bother me either though. So don't get me wrong. It's just. If you'd have just given me the face value of like a black mask and Tobias Whale and, and you know, Cheshire and some of these other villains that we had going on here. And, of course, Barbara Minerva, I would have been fine with that. I don't know that she needed to give me more than that. And it, I guess it adds to the, you know, potential peril of the whole thing, I suppose. But basically, if you go into this movie thinking you're going to get this epic, detailed, serious, you know, Dark knight ask type story. That's not what you're, that's not what they're going for. You know, I can tell you right now, they're trying to have fun, tell a fun story. And there is a little bit of an interesting motive for Catwoman as well, which I think was a really, really cool thing to bring up. So I would say if you go into this just wanting to have fun, I think you really enjoy Catwoman Hunted as I did, do not pass this one up if you're looking for something fun to watch in the DC animated universe realm. I think that this will definitely scratch that itch for you. And speaking of which, don't sleep on ISIS. Just saying, just saying, I think that you really, really enjoy that little kitty and the mess that ISIS gets in in this movie as well. That's going to do it from our review of Catwoman Hunted. Up next, going to head to Reboot City and talk about Bel Air. My spoiler-free review of the Fresh Prince reboot is up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is writer Brandon Easton, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. The Fresh Prince gets a fresh take. That's right. Bel Air is going to be premiering on Peacock on February the 13th after the big game. So, spoiler-free review time of Bel Air. And one thing right away that caught me when I was watching these first few episodes is that this show does not lean heavy into fan service. That much I can absolutely promise you. There's a couple of little winks and nods here and there, but I mean, this is a dramatic reboot of what was a show that could be dramatic at times, but it was mostly a comedy series that was when Will Smith was starring as the Fresh Prince. So this one definitely takes a different angle. And I will say this, you're going to see Will do some really stupid stuff for really stupid reasons. Well, at least what could be perceived as stupid. Let me put it that way. So that, and then you remember though, you go, okay, you remember how old he is and you remember the situation that he's in. And then you kind of go, yeah, you know, you can understand why, what ends up happening happened. You saw it in the trailer. It's really no secret whatsoever. So, and that's something that's going to linger on. That much I can tell you for sure. But when he gets to Bel Air is when the series really starts for me. And when you meet the Banks family in Bel Air and the very different tenor that the whole situation has. Philip Banks is still, you know, tough, but in a different way and carries himself a little bit differently than you remember in the previous series and running for district attorney, too, by the way, which is also a very interesting part of the story. But there's no character that is more different than Carlton Banks. And I've got to say, Ali Sholatan, you got to give him a nod for this one because he takes this character of Carlton to a completely different level. Carlton's like the made man in Bel Air. But once you see that there's way more to this character than that and the... I'll just call it journey that this character goes on is quite interesting. And his relationship with Will is a very interesting one to say the least. I got to say though, as far as characters that I really loved Coco Jones portrayal of Hillary 
I thought was off the charts good. She was fun, but she was take charge as well. And I've got to say, and I, maybe I'm biased because she's been on the show before, but Cassandra Freeman, her take, the way she plays Vivian Banks, that woman, I got to tell you, really, really shines in every scene that she's in. And where this show would be without Aunt Viv, I'm going to tell you right now, it would be in a very, very different place because she is the straw that's stirring the drink in these first few episodes. I promise you that in a lot of different ways. But the way you see Will struggle and then try to adapt and struggle and struggle and overcome struggles, but only to come up to new struggles, the journey that he goes on just in these first few episodes, I think is a really, really neat way that they portrayed this. And Jabari Banks, who hasn't done a whole lot acting-wise in his career, really brings a fresh take to the character as well. This doesn't feel like the same character, and I'm glad that they went that route. Because if it did, it wouldn't feel like an authentic reboot. It wouldn't feel different. And this had to feel different in order to work. And again, you're not shoehorning certain characters in just to work them in. So people remember, oh, I remember Jeffrey from the old Fresh Prince series. And Jeffrey's very different, by the way. And his relationship with with Philip Banks is a very, very cool one, I think. I also really like that this show tackles some real-life issues. But also, it's not just a... It, it creates the debate, I think. And it, and it gives you something to talk about other than saying, here's our opinion, take it or leave it. It is a it is very much a let's debate this issue sort of thing. And I really, really enjoy that they call, that they went that direction because you want people talking about your show and things that are happening in your show and the and to approach it with that angle, I think is the smart way to go because I I'm gonna tell you right now, there's a few things in this show that will get talked about. No doubt about it, whether it be on social media or amongst your friends in real life, since we're doing that again now. So this is a show that you'll talk about for sure, let me tell you. And there's a lot of really interesting things that they do. And I will say that I was worried that they were just going to try and take these characters and either make them completely different for the sake of making them different, or they were just going to go total fan service, and they did neither of those things. Each character that they bring up that you remember is fresh for, yes, absolutely pun intended. They are different. They have their own angles. They have their own struggles. They have their own interpersonal relationships and place in the family dynamic. And then there's the fact of, oh, by the way, we still have to keep Will safe for a reason and I got to tell you, I've got a bad feeling about a couple of characters on this show. And I can't really tell you who that is because spoilers. So there's just a lot going on here that makes this story work and, and that is different. I will say I was pleasantly surprised by this Bel Air reboot. Definitely give it a shot after the big game or at some point on Peacock. The first few episodes are going to be streaming on February the 13th. I'm very interested to see what you think about it. That's going to do it for my spoiler-free review of Bel Air. Up next, how about we head to some nerd news? I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Chin Han from Ghost in the Shell, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Old school's about to meet new school to save the world. It's time for nerd news and a whole bunch of trailers. Of course, with the big game being this weekend, that should be no surprise. Start with Jurassic World Dominion, which is going to come out from Universal in theaters on June the 10th, and yes, we have the old school members of the cast, Sam Neill, Laura Dern, and of course, the great Jeff Goldblum joining Bryce Dallas Howard, Chris Pratt, and company to try and save the world from the dinos who are kind of walking amongst us. I mean, like taking over the world, as, as Dr. Ian Malcolm would say, they have dominion over us, right? So you see basically dinosaurs running amok everywhere, and we, we've kind of gotten that impression by the prologues that have been released and some of the short films and stuff that Colin Trevorrow has been putting out, teasing this for the last couple of years. So 
What we also see, though, is move over, Baby Yoda. We've got Baby Blue to talk about. Raptor babies are going to be a part of this thing. And basically, you see Chris Pratt's character of Owen saying that they need to protect Blue. And you know that he's going to do that at all costs. The relationship between the two of them has been just an incredible one from the very beginning in the Jurassic World franchise. But we also see get to see some new dinos and some new uh, just giant creatures joining the mix here as well. And it's in the, the adage of, you know, we can't live, humans can't live with dinosaurs. And how is that going to come to a head? So you see a lot of crazy action sequences in this first trailer. I mean, if you've watched it already, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But what I'm going to find interesting is, is how the original Jurassic Park, Park cast comes into play to help the new cast of Jurassic World. And you already see that Dr. Grant and Owen are going to have a very interesting relationship. They might actually see eye to eye on a bunch of stuff. So I'm very curious to see how that dynamic is going to be. I'm actually really looking forward to seeing Chris Pratt and Jeff Goldblum play off of one another as well. So again, what we see is a lot of crazy action. You get to see B.D. Wong's character come back as well. And of course, if anybody plays a huge role in this whole mess, it's him. So again, you don't learn a ton from this trailer other than we're in big trouble because dinosaurs are everywhere. And we'll have to see how that shakes out on June the 10th. I know we'll have more trailers between now and then, though. One movie that slipped out of my radar, and I'm kind of mad at myself for that, is The Lost City from Paramount, which is going to be coming out on March the 25th. Also in theaters, Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum in this one. And basically, this one follows an author, played by Sandra Bullock. She does these romance adventure novels. And then Channing Tatum's Alan, who's the cover, the poster boy, you know, your romance novel cover guy. So basically, Sandra Bullock's character gets captured kidnapped by Daniel Radcliffe's character, who's the villain in this movie. And he thinks that this lost city treasure is real. So he kidnaps her trying to find it. And Alan decides, hey, I'm tired of being a book hero. I want to be a hero in real life. I'm going to go save you. And that's where it kind of all comes together. You see Brad Pitt is a part of this as well. Not a huge role, I don't think, but Brad Pitt, of course, makes an appearance in the the trailer. I was looking at the pregame spot as well that they released this past week. And I got to say, honestly, this one looks so much fun. And I say that because we don't have enough of these fun action adventure movies anymore. I mean, Jungle Cruise kind of started to try and bring that back. And I know to a certain degree, we also had Jumanji. The Jumanji movies have done that a little bit. But, you know, minus something from Dwayne Johnson, we haven't really gotten a lot of these. And that's to me, this is different. From the superhero genre, right? I know we've gotten a lot of fun action adventure stuff in the superhero genre. But what happened to stuff like this that we used to get in the 80s, in the 90s, and somewhat in the early 2000s? And then it just kind of was few and far between. So stuff like this, I think, is the kind of fun movie that we need to have, whether it be in theaters, whatever. This is the kind of thing I'm really looking forward to. And getting Channing Tatum back in the mix again, I think it's really, really neat. And seeing Sandra Bullock, of course, I love Sandra Bullock, always have. So I'm really, really excited for The Lost City from Paramount coming this March. One movie that is just insane, especially the cast, is The Atom Project, which is from Netflix. That'll be coming out on March 11th. Before I even tell you anything about this, listen to this cast. Ryan Reynolds, Zoe Saldana, Jennifer Garner, Mark Ruffalo. All in the same movie. Are you freaking kidding me? I don't know how they pulled that off. But it, it, it's absolutely incredible. This is from the same team that brought you, brought you Free Guy, by the way. Sean Levy back to direct this one as well. And basically, what you have here is a time-traveling pilot. And this is Ryan Reynolds' character. He teams up with his younger self and his late father, who is played by Mark Ruffalo. And the log line says to come to terms with his past while saving... The future. And what you get to see is a lot of futuristic tech, a lot of stuff flying around all over the place, a lot of spaceship type action, a lot of time travel, boom tube type stuff. And it just looks, again, it looks really, really fun. And just one of those things where you go, where's this been? Right? Where's this kind of sci fi 
movie been? And, and you know, Ryan Reynolds is going to make almost anything fun anyway. But you see a movie like this, especially, the, and I got to give props to the kid. In the trailer alone, you've got young Adam, and Adam is the, is the main character in the movie. But you've got young Adam, who is played by Walker Scobell. And this kid looks like he could be one of those future star type kids. You know, you see him in the movie when he's really, really young. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, you remember the kid from that movie? No, now he's all grown. He just looks like he plays off of Ryan Reynolds so, so well in this movie. And, you know, and there's the whole, you know, he misses his dad sort of thing. So we don't know what happened to his dad right now. I'm sure that's going to be a big part of this story once we actually do see this movie. But um, it, this is just another one of those things where it's got the great sci-fi vibes. It's got a whole bunch of fun as well. And just the chemistry between Ryan Reynolds and Walker Scobell's character, I think it's going to really make this. And then you wrap this amazing cast around this whole thing. It looks like Ryan Reynolds' character, the, the older Adam, has it looks like some sort of relationship with Zoe Saldana's character. And I'm curious to find out what that's going to be because, you know, the, you, saving the love of your life and saving the world are, are hand in hand sometimes. And I think that that could be what's going on here. But this just looks like the, there's so much, there's so many feel good vibes from this. I get some really fun vibes from this as well. And, the you know, the risk of time travel is, I'm certain, going to come into play here. So the Atom Project coming to Netflix on March the 11th. I cannot wait for this one. Here's one that you might remember me talking to you about several months ago, and that is The Tourist from HBO Max, which is a series. Basically, you've got Jamie Dornan and his character. You know, you think you're taking a nice leisurely trip to Australia, and then some a-hole runs you off the road, and you can't remember who you are. So basically, it's the whole, yes, I have amnesia. I don't know why somebody's trying to kill me thing. But the thing that makes this really interesting to me is that we're doing this in small town Australia. The town's called Burnt Ridge. And it's basically this, you know, like this almost like desert outback town, right? So you're doing the small town thing, but you're doing it in small town Australia. That's different, right? That gives you a little bit of a unique angle. And there's, you know, the whole line in the trailer of, you know, I don't know who I am. And they, and you hear someone say, you, you sure you want to sort of thing. So that to me is part of the really interesting angle of this whole thing. And we'll have to find out when the tourist premieres on HBO Max. And that is going to be happening on Thursday, March the 3rd. I just went ahead and looked that up for you. So it's going to be March the 3rd on HBO Max. I actually feel like it's almost like the late 90s, early 2000s again with a couple of pieces of news that came out. This one from The Hollywood Reporter. That's that Russell Crowe is going to be joining the Craven the Hunter movie, the Spider-Man spinoff, which is supposed to come out in 2023. Now, you might have forgotten that Aaron Taylor Johnson is actually going to be playing Craven in this movie. I forgot. So it wouldn't be, you know, if you forgot, that's that's perfectly fine. But Russell Crowe joining the movie and again, undisclosed role, blah, blah, blah. We're not telling you what's going on, yada, yada, yada. But I mean, it looks like if we're talking about Craven's dad and we're going to find out more about Craven's past, it, it seems to me like Russell Crowe could be the perfect, you know, dad figure for Craven. And let's face it, I mean, he's already played Jor-El. He's no, he's no stranger to playing superhero dads. But I mean, getting Craven on the big screen as the big game hunter who eventually goes off to hunt Spider-Man. And this is one. This is one of the Spider-Man spinoffs where I look at it and I go, okay, yeah, this could definitely work. So you can see why they're doing this movie. And and again, you get somebody like Russell Crowe that adds legitimacy to your cast. That can never hurt you. So I think this is a great addition to a movie. One of the few Spider-Man spinoff movies that I've really been looking forward to. Speaking of spinoffs, guess what? The National Treasure spinoff just added a big, big piece. The series that's going to be coming to Disney Plus just added Catherine Zeta Jones to the cast. And she's going to be playing one of the leading series roles in the series. Of course, the lead is going to be Lizette Alexis, who's going to be playing Jess in the movie, but Catherine Zeta Jones is going to be playing Billy and she's described as a badass billionaire, black market antiques expert and treasure hunter who lives by her own code. And basically she was penniless at first and now she's a sleek, stylish businesswoman sort of thing. Now the question is though, is she going to be the foil or is she going to be 
with Jess, the main character in the series? That, to me, is the interesting question. But again, a National Treasure series, sign me up for that all day. And I I actually suggested that that be done with a female lead, and it looks like that's the route they're going to go. So again, very few details about this, but I, I talked, how many times have I said it already just in this segment? Fun action adventure. We need more of that. And it looks like Hollywood might actually be listening to us for a change. So that's really, really cool. I can't wait to see Catherine Zeta Jones in this world and seeing a national treasure series brought back on Disney plus. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, thanks to Lola May Lochran for joining me this week to talk about In from the Cold. Also, thanks to this week's sponsor, Storyblocks. Make sure you go to storyblocks.com slash dnpod to find out all the creative ways that you can use Storyblocks. Also, find us online at downandnerdypodcast.com, at downandnerdy757 on Twitter and on Instagram, at downandnerdy on Facebook, and wherever you get your podcasts. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.